Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show Professor Robert Merton. He's a professor of finance at MIT, and he's the 1997 Nobel Prize laureate in economics. Professor, real pleasure to have you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and on your show. So your specialty is not only in the academic world, but is also in the practical world of uh, where I spend most of my time as a financial planner. And a lot of the work that you've done has been about retirement. One of the big issues that, that, uh, that I see as a financial planner, and certainly in the academic journals, is the problem that people are living too long. How has this affected the economic decisions that you think people need to be making? Well, it's a, it, first of all, the retirement uh, challenge, or that part of what we call the life cycle, you know, is, is a permanent part of our existence. It was needed to be addressed 200 years ago. It will need to be addressed 200 years from now and in every place in the world. So it's a very fundamental uh, part of our uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, existence. And it's a really big global challenge at the moment. And as you mentioned, the uh, fact that people are living longer, which is a great thing, I think, I, as, as one who's well along in years, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to continue to be here for a while. Uh, but it does also raise in the retirement uh, in, in, in space uh, some uh, major economic challenges. Uh, in, in very simple terms, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, we can each help each other out. But in the end of the day, a retirement system and an economic system has to balance. It has to be, you know, we can't, we can't, Produce what we don't. We, it's not feasible. We can't do what, what's not feasible. And common sense says the following: On average, we have to pay for our own retirement, each of us. Now, and if you, th- you want a simple way to think of it, if if uh, in the past, let's say, uh, if you take an educated population where they don't really start working till they're say in their early twenties or around twenties, so they go work uh, and depending again in the particular country, they might work uh, 40, 45 years, uh, say 40 years to make it simple for the example, uh, then when they retire, they must have uh, accumulated enough savings to be able to sustain uh, the lifestyle for which they've become accustomed uh, in the retirement phase. And so if in the past we worked for 40 years and retired for for uh, 10 years, uh, so we worked until till we were 65 and we on average lived till we were 75, then, you know, we have to pay for 40 plus 10 or 50 years of consuming from 40 years of work. And if you do the arithmetic, that means that you basically have income for 40 years and you got to pay for 50. So you're going to have to save 25% of your income to cover that on average. Now, that can come from all kinds of sources, Social Security, saving your house, and so forth. But that's the basic number. If we now, instead of living 10 years from age 65, on average, were to live 20, if we still work 40 years now, we have to support 60 years of consumption with 40 years of work. Uh, that would mean to pay for the 20 that we aren't working, we'd have to save a full um uh, a third, or, uh, you know, of our 33 percent or so of our income while we're working, and that's a very high saving rate. And people who have been saving at the old rate, or in retirement systems that projected that you would live, in my example, 10 years, and adjusted the amount saving and into those plans for that, uh, are now seeing themselves happily being perhaps living 20 years, this puts great pressure on the system because, you know, not enough saving was done for that. And so, uh, you know, that's at the, the heart of, of the, uh, as I say, the challenge. And then there's uh, there are many other elements also going on we could we could discuss. So but let's, that's let's, at the Let's core. focus on this pressure. The, the nice word you're using is it puts pressure on the system. But when I get my annual report from Social Security, it says, Dear Doug, we're going to be, you know, somewhat bankrupt by the time your turn comes along. How should we, as a as a baby boomer generation, be seeing that? Are we going to be able to count on the government? 
That's a very good question. Uh, I can give you an opinion. It's not a scientific answer because it's really, a, of course, a you know, government decisions as to uh, how much they do is, is is largely a political system for which I have no special expertise in forecasting. But my own opinion is that most governments are going to try to uh, sustain their obligations for 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 retirement. But what it may mean is that uh, because of the realities that they will either have to for the more affluent of uh, the population will not get as much from the government uh, so that those who are less affluent uh, can still be covered. Uh, I think eventually uh, the way, you know, when you see these bankruptcy uh, uh, projections, they're projections based on the status quo, nothing changing. And I think that uh, at least over a a somewhat longer horizon, not next year or the year after, and in any case, these systems aren't going to go down in that length of time, behavior is going to change. It isn't just that we may, uh, you know, up the Social Security or up the required contributions to uh, pension plans, uh, you know, to reflect what I said to you before. If if you're going to have a greater fraction of your life in retirement, um, then you're going to have to save more. And so it's reasonable to ask people, uh, to expect people in a system to, to save more. And so people see the rate going up, but it really is a statement that even, you know, whether it's Social Security or your own private saving, you're going to have to save more. And that means consume less, and that's because things have changed. The good news, again, remind yourself, is your dog are going to live longer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... Painver, that's a real trick. We are talking with Professor Robert Merton, who is a professor of finance at MIT, and he won the 1997 Nobel Prize in Economics. He's been giving us, I don't know if it's depressing news or optimistic news about the future. Uh, professor, let's focus a little bit more on that, because there is the, the baby boomer generation, which is really next in line, and the studies uh, you know, that I read seem to say that these people statistically and you know, on average are, are just not properly prepared for retirement, should they literally be panicking now? I don't think they should be panicking because panicking isn't yet generally, as I'm sure as a financial advisor, you know, not, not a very productive approach. But should they be concerned? Absolutely. Should they uh, be adjusting plans or trying to make provision for it? Absolutely. When you say the boomer, uh, you know, preparation, again, I'm more familiar with the U.S. system. I, I know about some of the other systems. Uh, our, you know, our retirement systems were our ba- retirement generally is broken into, you know, three sources: government, uh, employer plans, and personal saving family. And uh, the older of the boomers, at least in the U.S., many of them have uh, employer defined benefit plans in addition to Social Security. And those, you know, are, are despite the fact that they are under pressure. Those are, are likely to continue to pay. So er, older boomers, ones who are retiring, you know, sooner, probably if they've come through that kind of system are, are going to be in reasonably good shape or not particularly worse shape. Those that have, uh, are, are more, their retirement is further down the, the, the uh, time and they haven't that kind of retirement system, they are going to have to save more. I think the answer is going to be, quite frankly, that people are going to work after retirement, even if they formally retire at 65 or whatever number you pick, they're going to find because they're living longer and because they are uh, not just living in the sense of breathing, but, you know, they're more vital. They're able to do uh, the kinds of, you know, they are able to continue to work, many of them, if they don't have health problems, that uh, many are going to work another five years. So before anyone changes any official retirement rules, uh, I think you're going to see that as a phenomenon, and that's going to be one of the things that are going to help uh, later boomers to be able to sustain some kind of, uh, 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 of a comparable retirement to the style of life that they had when they were working. So that's a very uh, practical solution, which is if you don't have enough income coming in, we'll just go back to work. Yeah, and that, of course, presumes that, one, you can go back to work, uh, I think there, without getting off on the topic, I think because it, the boomers have been so big, 
once they start really retiring, we're actually going to see in many countries, I think in particular the United States, an absence of, uh, uh, you know, experienced employees. And so companies are going to look to their healthy, meaning capable, uh, older workers, and even if they formally retire, hire them back on a contract basis, let's say to work uh, five years I mean, serious work. So I'm, I, I think this is going to be feasible for a number of people. Obviously, for people who don't have the opportunity to go back to work or can't do it because of health issues, uh, are going to have to, uh, you know, find find other other means. And uh, but I do think that you know the, the 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 third part I should just mention is around the world. I've been traveling a great deal around the world, talking about retirement, meeting with uh, both governments and private sector providers, and so forth. That this is a recognized big issue, particularly in Asia. Uh, as, as much as the United States is aging, uh, China's aging even faster. Uh, particularly with the one-child policy. Uh, Korea is aging even faster than China and so forth. And so I see governments taking this quite seriously and, and revising uh, and, and, and developing their systems. The problem is that doesn't happen overnight. You don't build a new retirement system you know, in a year or two and, and fund it. So the, the longer term issue, let's say for the later uh, boomers, if you want to call them that, you know, may see changes in the systems that are designed to, to help them to better uh, accommodate themselves. But, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, somewhere where also you can bring in new technology. You know, once you make the decision, whether as a country or as a private sector uh, company, that you're going to have to change your system, that's a big deal. That's the bad news. The good news is that you can see if you're going to rebuild it, do it with all the most modern financial technology we have so that we get most we can out of the assets that are dedicated to retirement. And it's even possible that these countries that are redoing their systems could leapfrog uh, countries that have better retirement systems now by using new technology, not unlike what you saw happen when you build phone systems. Now, you don't uh, put up telephone poles and so forth as we still have in the U.S. You do everything uh, with the modern technologies of uh, uh, digital uh, phones. Right. Hopefully, we will see a lot of improvement there, and hopefully we'll see that the politicians who have to make these decisions will be foresightful enough to do that and won't just be looking around the corner to the next election, but will really be looking 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line to make wise decisions for the future. Well, I, I surely hope so. As I say, I I do see that in, in a number of Asian countries in particular. Uh, I'd like to believe it's happening in the U.S. There's a lot of technology being introduced, but it's really hard to get people excited about it until sometimes they have to have it see the whites of their eyes of what they don't have. And then they say, now we have a crisis. That's the scary part. Well, we spoke about some something a little pessimistic and something a little bit optimistic, but, Professor, we are just about out of time. We've been talking to Professor Robert Merton from MIT and the 1997 uh, Nobel Prize laureate in economics. In the last few seconds, just tell us, how can people follow you and follow your work? Uh, well, I have a, a MIT web, website, which is you could just put it in Google's. Probably put Robert C. Merton, and you'll get it. I have a personal website, uh, robertcmerton.com. Uh, you can also see some of my uh, more uh, uh, commercial or, or you know uh, private, you know, actually implementation of these ideas at Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, which is uh, you can get off the, off the internet as well. Okay, and we will put links to those at the show notes at goldsteinongelt.com. Professor Merton, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.